So a little while ago we talked about the Curry-Howard isomorphism where we interpret this arrow as either implication or the set of functions. So if we now these are mathematical functions, not JavaScript functions, right? Definition of a mathematical function says for each element of the thing on the left, you give me an element of the thing on the right. And that's it. It doesn't talk about whether it's computable or not. It doesn't talk about how much time it takes. It's just, you give me a thing on the left, I give you a thing on the right. If you can define um, that in whatever language you're working in, then we call that a function in math. So here, uh, the first part of the isomorphism says, we identify the empty set with false and the set with one element in it with true. Okay? Then we count how many functions there are between these four pairs. Well, how many functions are there from the one element set to the one element set? Well, if you give me the thing on the left, I have to give you that one thing on the right. There's a unique way of doing that. It's the identity function. And so the set containing just the identity function that is, the set of functions from true to true is the one element set. So it's true. This says true implies true is true. Well, how about the next one? If you give me dot on the left, there's no way I can give you anything on the right. So there are no functions from true to false. True implies false is false. Now here, I don't have to give you anything. And there's always a unique function into the one element set because it's terminal. Um, and so we have the set containing the unique function. This is satisfied trivially. Um, this is initial in the category of sets and functions. So there's a unique function out of it. That one's terminal, so there's a unique function into it. They are the same unique function. So this set containing that unique function is congruent, is um, isomorphic to the one element set. So false implies true is true. And similarly, we can just use the identity function on this. Say false implies false is true. So there's the basic outline, the fundamental idea underlying um, the Curry-Howard isomorphism. Now let's look at what happens when we say x implies false. Well that true implies false is false and false implies false is true. So if we're thinking of these as truth values, this is not x. Right. And then if we do that again, that's not not x. Now with truth values, not not x is the same as x. But in sets, you know, we can have anything in here for x, any set. And so what this says is if x is empty, we get back the empty set. But if x is non-empty, we get back the one element set. So in particular, if x has two elements, this thing has one element. It is not the same set as x. Um, so in general, there's no way to go from not not x to x. Now we see a reflection of this in JavaScript around Booleans. Um, there's notions of truthy and falsy. So for example, we have true, we have false, which is great. Not true is false. Not false, oops. Not false is true. That all works the way we expect it to. But then there are other things, like if you say not an object, that's false. So this thing is not a Boolean, but we can still apply this not to it and get a boolean out. Not not, this object, is true. It's not the object itself, it's 
the Boolean value true. So we're losing an enormous amount of information. Just like here, we're losing all the information about the elements of x. We're just getting back whether it was empty or not. And one of my favorite um, things that make you say what in JavaScript is this one. Boolean dot, oops, capital B, dot prototype dot not equals function return not this. That seems like a reasonable method to put on a Boolean, right? So then we can say true dot not. And we get false. Great. That's wonderful. Now false dot not. What? Why would false dot not give back false? Well, when you use the dot operator on a primitive value, it promotes the value to an object of the appropriate type. So these primitive booleans get promoted to boolean objects. And here in this, uh, in this method, the this keyword is bound to an object that is wrapping the primitive. And when the bang operator applies to that object, the object is truthy no matter what it's wrapping. And so we always get false out. What we really want is something like not this dot value of and then false dot not returns true. Great. So now we have this notion of double negation. What does this mean from a type perspective? Okay, what if I have a type x arrow f, well let's just say z arrow z, how do I read that? Well, this is something that's expecting a function from x to z and then returns a z. The simplest way to get one of those is if we have an x, right? So say x is in 32, and we have one of those, say 5. Well, a datum of this type, when x is in 32, this is hom, hom, in 32, z, z. And that's how we would write it in our JavaScript contract notation. So what does this say? See, I've got the number 5, and you hand me a function from integers to z's. Well, then I can invoke that thing and get a z back, and then I can return it. So function Give me a k, it's this type, turn k of 5. Right? So if k is this type, the whole thing would be this type. Right? Now this looks kind of familiar. In fact, say this is strings instead. And say the string looked like uh, that, uh, quotes around everything in JSON. So now this says, 
if k is something that expects a string and does something with it, then this whole function will be something that expects a function and invokes it on this JSON. But I've seen that pattern before, right over here. jQuery is complete. Now you've got this Ajax method here on your jQuery object. Complete expects a function and then invokes that function on the string that it got when it was done with its um, with its uh, fetch. So jQuery's complete is something that has this signature, right? a string in there, and then you know undefined. It doesn't matter what the thing returns; it just throws the value away. So we might as well put the identity contract in there. Okay, so jQuery's complete looks like this. It turns out that that is a very powerful um, design pattern that came out of logic. Right, we go from double negation, which is uh, a natural thing to look at in logic, and you get this continuation pattern. When, when the AJAX request completes, continue programming, uh, continue processing it in this way. And so what we get is a functor called CP for continuation passing, and it takes any contract C to this signature that we were just looking at. It has the same signature as jQuery's complete. At least at heart. I mean, jQuery's complete is wrapped up in object notation and various other stuff, but it, it does this at heart. And we see here it has there's this natural way of uh, creating something that has this signature. Right? If I have a string x, I can give you something that mocks out the fetch and invokes your com completion method that you provided on that string. Right? So this is a way of constructing mocks for, for Ajax queries. Also, we have a way of pipelining queries. So if you have nested um, application of this CP functor, then if we have one thing that is waiting on something that is waiting on that value, well, both of them are able to execute once we have the value, so we might as well combine them into a single um, a single function, and this is how that takes one that's doubly wrapped and produces one that is singly wrapped. So because we have something that takes wrapped zero times to something wrapped once, once it does it twice to once, then that means we get a monad. And it's monoidal. We saw monoidal functors two times ago with the uh, lazy functor. Here we have something that's this uh, mock for XHR that's going to feed in a product of values. So you might think, well, before we invoke the, co the continuation, we're going to parse out the JSON we're expecting an array, so we're going to feed in the array to the continuation, to the complete method, right? So this says if I have one of those, then I can turn that into a product of things that are waiting for their individual values. Right? So if I have all of the values at the same time, 
I can invoke a whole bunch of waiting things as they come in. I can't necessarily go the other way. If I have a whole bunch of things waiting for their values, I can't combine them into one thing where I can supply all the values, because maybe only one value came back from the, the network request. So when that first one comes back, I can't fill in all the others until the others come back. So the, the arrow doesn't go the other way. This is, this because I have this way of rewriting it, CP is a monoidal functor. And then CP is a closed functor. So if I start out with something with this signature, I can get something with this signature. So here, well here, we had a product that was double negated. Here we have a function that is double negated. So what the the final signature we get is a to b double negated and then this block here says you give me an a double negated and I give you a b double negated. Right? So here I had product double negated and I get a product of a's double negated. Here I have a function double negated and I get double negated input to double negated output. These two functions here allow you to combine continuations in um, all of the ways you need to to write programs, uh, to write asynchronous programs.